Fixate on Code, Episode 2. All right, Larry Buerta here, and you're listening to Fixate on Code, the weekly bite-sized podcast where I talk to the best devs about their favorite strategies for writing great code. And today's featured guest is Brian Lonsdorf. Brian, it's great to have you on the show with us. Thanks for having me. Brian is the lead user experience engineer at Salesforce. More importantly, Brian is the first person in history to leverage highly educated stop-motion hedgehogs to make functional programming accessible to JavaScript developers. He is a regular speaker at conferences, an author, a podcast host, and a teacher who has a knack for making complicated content fun to learn. Brian, we can safely say that the category for stop-motion hedgehogs teaching functional programming has been firmly established by Professor Frisbee. Can you fill in some of the gaps in that intro and tell me a little bit about what you get up to when you're not writing code? Um, Well, let's see. I mean, I like airbrush. I'm trying to learn how to make like airbrush shirts. (laughs) That'd be kind of fun. I just like every day rock like a new like, you know, 90s emo band shirt that I made myself with airbrush. (laughs) But then, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to get into squash. Like, I've never actually played squash, but I think that would be something that I'd be interested in. It's like racquetball, but like harder, I think. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever seen squash? We don't have racquetball here. We've only got squash and I'm terrible at it. Yeah, there you go. So I'm going to try it. Like, racquetball is for, for people who like bouncy balls. Squash is the real game, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, you're not a real racquetball player unless you play squash. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like... The hardcore <laughs> racquetball. So no, I don't know. There's that. Um, I don't really, you know, I don't do that much. I like to create things. You know, that's like my my jam. So like, you know, I grew up making music and recording stuff, and you know, whatever else. <laughs> just every time you make something, you I feel good about myself, and so I just kind of keep making things. <laughs> All right, Brian, tell me the story about how you got to where you are right now. What were the steps that brought you to where you are today? Um, you know, actually. It's interesting. I, I started out, um, you know, as like a Rails dev in the in mid two thousand, um, and kind of went through a bunch of different languages and stuff. And uh, you know, one of the, you know, I started. To, I didn't actually go to school for code, and so I've just been practicing continuous learning uh, since I started. And yeah, I guess it just takes. Uh, 10 years of nonstop continuous learning to uh, <laughs> finally realize what's good and bad. It's like, you know, the, the Crockford's the good parts. Like, I feel like there should be like that for all of programming. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, you know, I went on a lot of bad paths and, and stuff. But, I, you know, I typically like I went through all the Fowler books and Uncle Bob books and Kent Beck and, you know, just. Just books and books. My favorite one, I think, like a pivotal one for me was uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Mm-hmm. That was an incredible book about just like really getting the heart of domain modeling and program design um, uh, from an object oriented perspective. I, I just like absolutely love that. Uh, but yeah, and then I and then I uh, threw it all away for functional programming. <laughs> <laughs> so over the past ten years, I mean, you've you've hit the bad, the good parts, and you've hit the bad parts. Can you take me to the worst experience you've ever had on a project? Yeah. Uh, so so that's like it's really tricky because. I've I've had a lot of bad bad experiences <laughs> on projects, but I think I think uh, you know like there's different aspects, right? Sometimes like at one point we were working for this guy who's like a you imagine a caricature of like George W. Bush, like this guy is just like a cartoon version, <laughs> and and he's he's like. You know, we'd, he'd ask for a feature. We were doing consulting, right? And we were a small company, and he had all this money. It's just like, you know, kind of angel investor in himself. He's just making this social network for video sharing. And every time we deliver a feature, he would just expect like way too much. You know, you'd expect like, you know, team of engineers, Facebook style, like, you know, like, uh, why can't I crop my video? <laughs> like, well, <laughs> You didn't ask for that feature. We delivered, you know, the base minimum viable product to get you up and running. And it just, you know, it just turned into like a awful experience with just managing expectations. But code wise, I think, uh, you know, just time and time again on different projects, I find that like I end up in a bad experience in my code base when I haven't 
really been diligent about um, you know modeling and getting rid of all the snowflakes and exceptions uh, throughout the code. You know, there's always it kind of goes back to that domain driven design book. It's like if you keep hammering at the heart of what's going on, you're going to eventually realize that your domain or your model for your application um, can be simplified and, and made more general and, and you can get rid of all these exceptions by just kind of changing the model itself. So that, that's that been you know pretty much the path I fell into with just bad models and lots of exceptions and if-elses everywhere and, and it's just a lack of actually modeling things. So, I mean, it pretty much comes down to preparing upfront before you dive into any of the writing. Yeah, well, I think I think there's a little bit of both. Like the whole the whole process is is supposedly like you know you you write some code and then you take a step back and say like well what do I have here like what's going on what are all these like little things coming up that I didn't anticipate and then you revisit the model and you just keep doing that over and over again um, until you end up with something that's very elegant and smooth and and it all just makes sense. So um, I think you know. Actually, going back to the um, object-oriented versus FP kind of ideas, like I found that, um, like in the, in that one particular project that was really really bad, where we had all these uh, like just a bad model, I I was kind of like really heavily relying on objects and delegation, and everything was trying to do one thing, and it just ended up with this like trails of indirection of like this object has a reference to this object which have a reference to this object and like everything <laughs> just did the one thing um, except like they all were kind of tangled together despite the fact that I was trying to use like the utmost like best techniques and um, protecting yourself from from uh, you know change so uh, you know with with um, modeling I, I found that um, the actual you know, wash, rinse, repeat of of how do you like let's write some code and let's go back and see what we we have. Um, I, I find that I'm gearing towards math nowadays. Like, what kind of mathematical structure do I have? Not uh, what kind of objects am I trying to model? Mm. So, Brian, on a daily basis, which method, tool, or service are you using that you just hate to be without? Um, well, I think uh, I mean. I think it depends on the projects that I'm working on, you know, but I think it always comes down to the same thing and it's it's about focus. Like the Pomodoro is about like focus and getting the best results. What what I try to do is I if I'm in a dynamic language, I'll be writing, you know, tests after test and up front like kind of the BDD TDD style but a lot more like loose. Mm-hmm. I just want something when I get distracted to come back and tell me where to where to pick back up again. Um, so if I wrote a test that says like, you know, usernames should show up on screen, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. then like I start programming, I could always just run the test and figure out exactly where I left off and exactly what I was doing um, instead of uh, just you know getting a notification, walking away, having a meeting, and then coming back and like just trying to regroup like I can just instantly pick back up um, and it's actually really important in an enterprise world where they force you into meetings every ten minutes mm. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, no typed language uh, the types do the same thing right instead of spending all day writing tests up front i i um write i mean I don't write a whole test suite up front, I write the one test, but the, you know, the process of writing a test allows you to come right back to where you left off. And in a types system, you could just write your types and write undefined and make some type holes and you know, walk away, get distracted, do whatever, and come right back to exactly where you left off because the compiler is just like, this type doesn't type check. <laughs> so, which, which languages are you working in at the moment? Are you working in pure scripts or some abstraction of JavaScript at the moment? Um, so I, I'm a huge fan of pure scripts and I'm always on and off with that. Like I'm always drawn back to pure scripts for little projects here and there. Um, Haskell is, is, you know, my main typed language I would, uh, language I would choose. Um, but it turns out that, uh, I'm doing a Scala project at work now. So it's, you know, that's the kind of, um, that one's crazy though. Their types are nuts. <laughs> They're like subtyping and type lambdas and all sorts of type stuff in there. But uh, yeah, so we got those kind of three, but I, I prefer Haskell uh, um, as a 
main language. Um, and I think Pure Script will soon beat that out as my favorite, but who knows? Yeah, I've noticed that as my skills develop, there are these markers like really enjoying a new language that sort of indicate my progress, which it's awesome for feedback. Now, Brian, on a daily basis, where where do you still meet frustration? Where do you feel there's room for things to be done more effectively? Um, you know, I, I think uh, what I do right now is um, I kind of, I have my tests and, and I have my, my types and I kind of go, you know, depending on the language I use that uh, practice to like be able to pick right up. Um, but oftentimes um, I also find that like I'll start uh, from a, a perspective where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to pick up my, um, you know, I have a little to-do list on my like text edit. I have like a thousand to do's, you know, <laughs> and I'll make like a little group. I'm like, first you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, then you're going to do this for each like feature, just so I can just like have my, um, my set, you know, I can just like kind of scope out the whole feature with text and then I go start it. Um, and then I come back to my text to see, you know, to see where I've, uh, what I have to do next. And it lets me kind of like plan a little up front and whatever. Um, but I think I could probably get that down to a better science. Like, you know, my managers are like, what, it, what are you doing all day? <laughs> I put all my, my stories in my text edit. I don't actually put them in the, you know, their Kanban system or whatever it is. <laughs> so um, I think there's still, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement on these like, you know, Trello and, and, um, all these kind of like story based card based things. Mm-hmm. Like I want my own little individual task list that anyone can kind of zoom in and see. I don't want to have to announce to the world that first I'm going to get the users from the database, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, I think there's like, I think there's, there's a room for improvement on, on that, but it also really, really helps having this like map of like it, when you're in the code, you kind of start thinking about different things. And if you just have a bullet list of like the actual feature, like this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen. I don't have to think as hard. <laughs> so, And I think with all those tools, it's, it's quite personal. I mean, I go, through, I go through tons of them before I find any particular one that I'm happy with. Now, in terms of new projects, libraries, or frameworks, is there anything at the moment that's got you really excited? Uh, you know, I, I have to say it's... Uh, I'm excited about, um, let's see, Pure Script Halogen is, is very exciting to me. I, I don't use it because <laughs> it's kind of hard. I'm like trying to figure it out. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of um, Redux getting popular, and um, which is kind of like free monads in disguise, or if you're coming from an object perspective, like object algebras or the command or interpreter pattern, like what... The idea that the the industry is moving away from, uh, you know, tangling the semantics and interpretation of their program, they, they we're going to separate them now and say like this button was clicked. Now let me go interpret that action. Um, leaves, you know, it, it's making the best separation possible. I think for a code base to say like, now you know my UI just says what happens, and I have an interpreter to interpret those actions, and that that really. It's a really big deal, but I, I don't know if um, I think Halogen might have cracked the nut. <laughs> I'll see. I'm not very experienced with it yet, um, but I think all these emergent technologies that allow us to uh, separate the semantics throughout the entire code base versus just in one specific little UI portion, like Redux does. Can you go a little bit deeper into what Pure Scripts Halogen is actually solving? Um, well, it's a UI framework. Um, but it, it gives you extremely strong typing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the promise is that you're, you're separating um, in, in the same vein as Redux, where you separate uh, the actual like, actions in your code from the interpretation with reducing. Um, we have the idea of a free monad, which can allow you to combine um, any function, not just... Um, you know, your actions with your reducers, but everything in your whole entire code base can be separate from 
what should be happening, like each action. Uh, so just normal model functions and whatever uh, else, they can all be combined and then fed it into a, an interpreter. Um, so I think Halogen is kind of banking on that idea and giving you like extremely small, strong typing and, and letting you model your entire program uh, in this kind of fashion, which is really neat. Okay, so there's, there's tons of libraries and, and new languages and all these things coming out. How do you decide on what you actually want to learn and how do you make the time to learn all these new things? <laughs> you know, for me, I'm not, I don't really like JavaScript fatigue and all that stuff is like, for me, I'm, I'm just slowly reading my, my, you know, hundred year old theory books. I'm not, you know, like it, it doesn't seem like, so when, not, when, once I got on the, uh, the kind of functional path, I was, I was originally overwhelmed saying like, okay, there's all this functional stuff to learn and it's like this ocean and it never ends. There's so many FP concepts. But then you realize that like, it's just, um, you know, it's just the same math in different uh, clothing, you know, from, from this, you know, from each perspective. So, so like you have your, your Lambda calculus and your category theory and your group theory and, and things like that. And they all, um, are really good at modeling code. And so the more I learn about that, the more I realize like, oh, this concept is just the same, like in this concept in group theory is the same as this one in set theory, or you know, like this one in uh, uh, category theory models like these 20 different concrete disciplines in, in an abstract way. And so this learning path of just kind of like understanding the main general concepts that appear over and over and over again in mathematics, um, specifically abstract algebra, has kind of put me on just a very slow, mellow learning path and with a clear end in sight, not necessarily like, you know, we're going to figure out the Da Vinci code or something, you know, like <laughs> the math stuff. Like, it's just going to be, it's just going to be a... Uh, a nice, like, one day I'll, I'll finally understand fields and spaces and, and you know, that'll, that'll be the same as, like, five other concepts. So it's good. So it's about using pure maths and those theories in programming. Are there textbooks that bring the ideas together or how would you go about approaching it? Well, so, um, you know, I, I would wish, I, I would want more programming texts on on the uh, bridge between the pure mathematics and, and code. But I think the thing about the thing about these books are, especially abstract algebra, is like just take um, you know a group, right? So um, if you have a concat operator um, with no actual laws associated to it, no properties it holds, just it can you have concat on two elements, right? Um, that's called a magma. And, and then if we decide to add associativity as a property, like whenever I concat these two things, same function, same exact thing, but if, if associativity holds, now all of a sudden we have a semigroup, right? And, and if, um, you know, we have an identity element in addition to that, we have a monoid, and if we have, you know, inverse elements, um, you know, in our set, like, just how numbers have negative numbers, um, you can have inverse elements. And so now you have a, gr a full group because you can add and subtract because adding an inverse is subtraction. So what, what you end up doing is um, just slowly building on these ideas from abstract algebra. And it, and it doesn't really feel like there's a difference between programming and that because once you realize that you know, this abstract plus method is just concat, a concat method on an object, then it becomes very clear how that bridge happens and what properties and laws hold in your code and what you can do with that. <laughs> okay, I think I need to revisit some of my textbooks from Varsity. Right. You often come across people talking about the parallels between programming and maths, but I'd never found the connection to be obvious until taking the time to look at um, a little bit of category theory and, and abstract algebra. Now, Brian... Which specific aspect about programming has dramatically changed the way that you think about and write code? Well, I think uh, when it comes to like an aspect, um, I don't, I don't know if there's one one thing, but I can say that like there's there's all these little rules that are not um, 
really, t- it, they're, they're not formal. And, and like, so people just throw out like, oh yeah, we have like the law of Demeter or whatever, you know, and, and we, we want to pass in like as the smallest amount of information to a function. So it can't just grab extra stuff and it's easier to understand, which my favorite line is Martin Fowler calls it the occasionally useful suggestion of Demeter. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, the idea is that like, you know, we've got, we've got these little rules and int- intuitions that we build up and we don't necessarily, um, formalize them in a way that is as simple as math can be. Um, we're like, here's a general, general property of programming. Like you should use the least, um, powerful, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, like construct. So I don't need to, uh, if I was just going to make a static website, I don't need to launch an Erlang process with all these different actors across all these different nodes on EC2. Like that's just overkill, right? Um, but people go into JavaScript with the mentality of like, "Ooh, generators! That's really powerful. I should mm-hmm. be using generators, <laughs> right?" And, it, and it's like most of the time you're overcomplicating it by the tools you use. Um, and and so that intuition mixed with like just all the little all the little rules that that come up um, throughout your career that you're like oh you know what I found that this doesn't work for me I'm always going to do it this way until I find a reason not to and yeah I mean mainly mainly um, so I, I think all all the um, all the little pieces of nuggets of wisdom that that you come across um, as a developer that just guide you in, in every little decision is is really it's just an accumulation of all those little things and I think there could be more work done on the formalization of uh, you know what what happens when you make this decision like you know am I am I going to do this callback here or am I going to pass it over there like there's this inversion of control happening but what what did I gain and what did I lose from that and I think that hidden intuition that you build up that makes you a good programmer over the years is if we were talking about that and formalizing that, somebody could just pick that up and be like, oh, okay, I'll do this when I want this and I'll do that when I want that, you know? Anyway, I hope I'm not speaking too abstractly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is quite a concept, but how would you go about quantifying something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's very easy to, to say like principle of, of least um, power can be made into like, you know, the same concept of the, you know, lowest common denominator or, you know, um, least upper bound, which, you know, I guess we have um, the greatest lower bound, least upper bound, we have a lattice and you can kind of create this like structure where you can't, um, you know, go above this, this level, you know, everything kind of has a, a meet and a join, but the thought is that um, you can you can actually formalize that in a way that that you know can capture um, some properties and 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 then from there you can let those properties guide your decisions. Just just to throw it out an example, like um, if I have an uh, associative operation, it can be parallelized, right? That's just something that can happen. But if I didn't know, um, like I didn't I didn't have to go through. Like so, so for instance, you can take a for loop and with a bunch of imperative steps, and that's not clear how that has anything to do with associativity until you refactor that for loop into, you know, like a a map, for instance, mm-hmm. and, you know, and now and now we have this like uh, this thing that like does this combination and then you know it's preserving composition and we've got this you know functor from category theory that we can look at and figure out how that works and then um, perhaps we can combine these functors in associative ways and it just becomes which this turns into I suppose a, a monad but um, you can get to associativity from a for loop pretty pretty easily um, or you know you can say for each of these things, um, I want to run this operation. I want to combine them all. And now you have a monoid and that holds associativity and that gives you the parallelization. So, so like those, those things, I think, um, if, if we spent more time as an industry trying to, trying to really understand the theory about what we're doing in every little decision, I think we would be much better off instead of just being like, I don't know if this is good or bad yet, but I'm going to make this decision and it'll, 
either hit us or it won't. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. Yeah, and that, that'll be quite a paradigm shift, but I suppose the industry's adoption of more functional approaches is uh, it's a step in the right direction. And with that, we've come to the end of our first segment. Brian, I'm about to throw some quick fire questions your way. Let's do this. What is the best advice about programming you've ever received? The best advice about programming I've ever received. Um, let's see. Uh, don't just make things up. <laughs> try to find a, <laughs> try to find a principled solution because if you can do that, you won't you'll you won't have that many exceptions in your code, and it'll be very clean. <laughs> Brian, which personal habits do you attribute to writing better code? Um, I think. I think uh you know being able to to break things down um is always a good is a, always a good ability and and being able to uh you know focus on on one thing at a time and and then build it up into bigger things. I guess I'm just describing composability. So mm. composability. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Frisbee's mostly adequate guide to functional programming is an awesome introduction to FP. If you could recommend one book on programming to join Professor Frisbee's, what would it be and why? Uh, well, definitely going to recommend Haskell book. <laughs> it's uh, one of the, it's, it's pretty much like the best programming, functional programming book out there right now, I would say. So I um, think, yeah, that's, or, or the rest of the book that I haven't written yet. <laughs> Part two is a great, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, nice. So you're working on a on a second part for mostly adequate. Uh, yeah, I've got like four chapters all started on something like monad transformers and traversable and thing foldable and stuff like that. Just to just to try to get it across, get it over the the edge of like this is almost useful, but you're totally going <laughs> to run into some problems without without the rest of this information. So yeah, I, I, I'll I'll eventually finish it, but work keeps getting busy. Nice. That's super exciting. So who in the front end world is doing work that's really inspiring? You know, when you, uh, so, so the front end world is, is an interesting, um, interesting world because there's so much to it. You know, there's, <laughs> there's like um, Sarah Drasner is doing awesome stuff with like SVG and Rachel Neighbors is doing really great stuff with like animation. But, um, you know, I, I also think John DeGoes with, you know, his FP stuff with like, you know, he's, he's kind of driving a lot of the pure script front end, um, code and coming up with really amazing, um, you know, technology for, for recursion patterns and, and just good, good practices as far as FP goes in the front end. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's, there's a wide array of, of different skill sets, but I would, I would name drop them, those three. So just to reverse things a bit over here, Brian, Imagine you wake up and you have no recollection of ever having written code. With the tools, books, and courses available today, how would you go about learning to program from scratch? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Like, I almost wonder, like, if I like, I almost want to give myself amnesia and like, do that. <laughs> like, just like tattoo it, the path on my arm. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think you could. I would start with um, just you know basic lambda calculus. You learn that in like a weekend. It's it's very very simple. It looks scary. It looks complicated. But like there's like a few rules, and once you get it down, you're like, oh okay, I'm just substituting things, which is actually evaluation. And um, you know there's different stru- uh, strategies, alpha and beta, and once you know like lazy and whatnot. But like you can you kind of get a really good foundation on um, things like type theory if if you start with like a little bit of lambda calculus and a little bit of set theory that will make so many false starts at least in the fp world um you you won't have to you know revisit it later once you understand this stuff i think set theory and lambda calculus is is a very very easy getting started and very um powerful tools that you'll use forever and then yeah and then just start writing haskell (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> start off light. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So Brian, let's uh-huh. wrap up with your top tip on how to work smart, the best way to connect with you, and then we'll say goodbye. All right. So how to work smart. That's a uh 
<laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I revisit the idea of like, you know, take a step back and on your feature, write down, and this is what I do. I write down like what needs to happen to make this feature work, you know, from start to finish, just like the over idea, overarching like ideas. Like, do we need to get data from the database? Do we need to store it? Do we need to like generate it? Whatever. Um, and then um, if you're in dynamic languages, just, you know, write a test uh, and, and start out. And then, you know, if once you pass the test, you go into the next thing. And and that that process, it just like saves so many headaches. And then if you're doing a functional type language, I would highly recommend, um, you know, doing the same thing. But instead of te- uh, tests, use the types to drive it and then use tests afterwards to kind of lock it down. So, yeah. And the best way to connect with you? Oh, Twitter. Um, I am Dr. Boolean on Twitter. And, you know, it's so funny. I'll like, I'll like meet someone at a meetup or something and I'll be like, yeah, you know, like they'll be like, let's, let's exchange information so we can contact each other. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just Dr. Boolean on Twitter. And they're like, oh, you want me to be a follower? Great. <laughs> like, like no for real it's like just as good as a text message and i have my work phone my other phone and like i just get twitter notifications i like pretty much use twitter exclusively for their dm <laughs> this guy's just pitching at me again I know, right i feel like such a jerk but yeah dr bullion on twitter is is good but if if you really want to contact me it's brian at lupiker.com so. <laughs> to everyone out there you've been hanging with brian lonsdorf and larry Buerta. head over to fixate.it where you'll find links and timestamps for everything we've been talking about today. And of course, head over to egghead.io and catch up with Professor Frisbee and his introduction on composable functional JavaScript. Brian, thank you for sharing your journey with Fixate on Code. Keep pushing the limits and keep pushing great code. 